Hi, I'm Cressel Anderson, this is Maker Size. In this episode, we'll be casting some metal. Not only will I cast the base for the tailstock on the lathe project, I'll cast it twice. My foundry runs on kerosene. I use compressed air to draw kerosene out of a mason jar and spray it into the foundry. I adjust it with a needle valve and a pressure regulator. Sometimes I try to light the foundry directly. That doesn't work nearly as well as just lighting the flame and then sticking the nozzle into the foundry. I load up a charge in the crucible and then I drop it down into the foundry. These pans are pretty cool because you can fold them up and the foundry just eats these things. That is real time. The lathe project is based on the book by David Gingery. Take a look in the description for a link. To cast parts you first have to make the pattern. I use a combination of different stock and thin sheets of cardboard uh, to get it up to the quarter inch that the pattern in the book calls for. And then I glue all those pieces together, clamp them up, let them dry. One of the things I do is I tilt the bed of the bandsaw about five degrees to give it draft on the side of the pattern. That way you can extract it from the sand. I use wood filler to form fillets on the inside corners of the pattern. Again, helps with uh, extraction. And I sand that down, use a tack cloth to clean it up. And then I apply a little bit of shellac uh, just to kind of help the moisture from the sand not go, not be absorbed into the pattern. I store the sand in these five gallon buckets uh, to try and keep the moisture in the sand and reduce the amount of mulling that I have to do. Uh, it really is a pretty good test for how well the sand sticks together. Put a molding board on the two cross pieces and then I put the drag on top of that. And I can fill it with sand, ram the sand into the drag, and then clean up the top. Line up the pattern pretty much where you want it, and then you tap it down into the drag. And this allows those uh, protrusions off the bottom of the pattern to be recessed into the sand. Baby powder helps keep the sand that goes in the top part of the molding box, the cope, from sticking to the sand in the bottom part. Pins help with alignment, and then I use a screen to get fine sand right on top of the pattern. Here I'm cutting the sprue. and forming a little pouring dish. And this is, I insert a rod to tap the pattern. That way it kinda comes out of the bottom of the cope. And I clean up the pattern. You tap on the pattern to uh, help it kinda release from the mold. That's a turkey baster that I've converted to blow the sand off. You cut a gate between the sprue and the part, and then you reassemble the cope on top of the drag using the pins for alignment. The C-clamps are important because they keep the cope and the drag from separating due to the hydrostatic pressure of the aluminum in the mold. One thing you should note is that I do prepare the mold well in advance of heating up the furnace. I really don't like the stress of trying to get the mold down while I've got a crucible of molten metal in the foundry. I 
I used pine sticks put down in the molten metal to try and degas the aluminum. Let me know what you think about that method. It seems to work okay, but the embers are a little bit of a pain. When I pour the part, I always try to have a little left over. And so I pour them into a baking tray to make ingots. I really like using shallow ingots because when I go to remelt them, the relatively high surface area helps those blocks melt better. And then I just knock them out. So far, so good. Uh-oh. Shrink void. I weighed the part so that I would know how much metal to use next time. And then I used a number of ingots and gave myself a little extra to spare. My wife picked up this kiln from a thrift store for 10 bucks. It had a sign on it that said it hadn't been used in 40 years. And it burned off some of the years of dust. I hooked up a fan to try and keep the smell down. I also had to make some of these cones. It only came with one, and I made the other out of plaster of Paris and play sand. I ran the kiln for a while, and then I realized that my splitter was only rated at 15 amps. It melted, and I pulled out the insides. Don't try and put 19 amps through a 15 amp plug. I decided to go ahead and take the opportunity to upgrade the 40-year-old cable. So I used some 12-gauge wire, uh, stranded so that it would be flexible, and rated at 90 degrees C for the insulation. Once I had wired the internals of the kiln, I used a 20-amp rated plug uh, to go into the 20 amp circuit in my basement. And I picked up some fire extinguishers just to be on the safe side. I plugged it in, kept an eye on my time, kept an eye on the temperature using a handheld IR thermometer, which turns out is not really very accurate around the melting point of aluminum. So the first time I had to put the lid back on, Turn the kiln on, waited a little while, and then I turned the kiln off. And this time it was ready to go. Skimmed off the dross, not nearly as much as with the foundry. I also think it was pouring at a much higher temperature. Uh, you can kind of see the metal is glowing. I really would like to get a pyrometer so that I can do this a little bit more repeatably. I also think the kiln will provide a good opportunity to do some really precise temperature control for pouring. Hook up a thermocouple to uh, some sort of a microcontroller. So far, so good. And yes, indeed, the hotter pour temperature, the runner and the sprue, wider inlet gates, help me pour apart without the shrink void. Thanks for watching.